Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to all of you from wherever you're joining us this Monday. We are glad you chose to be with us for this exciting occasion, the launch of the CGI Agenda platform, uh, generating evidence and new directions for equitable results. That is the full uh, uh, name of the platform. My name is Vivian Atakos. I am a communication specialist at the International Potato Center. I am your host for this session. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat box so that we know who is in the session with us. And I'd also like to invite you to feel free to interact with us. Uh, please leave your comments, leave your questions in the chat box. And also you may engage with us via uh, social media. We are active on Twitter. Our social media handle is at CGI Agenda. And uh, the event hashtag is Feed the Cities and also another is AGRF 2020, and where space allows you may add in gender in ag. So to begin this session, we have a short video that will help us to set the scene for this event. Meet Amina, she's a farmer. She sows and harvests. She feeds and tends her family's animals, collects fuel wood, carries water. She sells crops she grows. She shops and cooks. She funds her children's education, cleans house, takes care of the sick and elderly. Despite all of this, Amina has less access to assets, opportunities, and benefits than her husband, her brother, her father, or her son, much less. This inequality hurts more than women and girls. It holds back whole communities and societies. If the world's women and men food producers had equal access to resources, yields would increase and everyone would have more and better food. The number of hungry people could be reduced by 150 million. If women and men had equal access to land, loans and learning, if the norms and policies that favor men today included women's preferences, realities, and ambitions, together, men and women could transform lives and livelihoods. Join the CGIR gender platform. Help us build and use evidence to make gender equality central to agriculture and our entire food system. Because when wives, sisters, mothers, and daughters move forward on equal footing with their husbands, brothers, fathers, and sons, our communities and continent will be well and truly nourished, finally. Amina, she's a farmer. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you, Michael, for that video. And uh, that summarizes what we are about. And just to introduce the CGI Agenda Platform, we have uh, Nicoline Dehan, who is the director for the Gender Platform. Welcome, Nicoline. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, and I thank everyone for taking the time after a long day, probably, to join us. Um, I want to introduce the gender platform. I will first start by introducing the gender platform. And then we will have uh, two case studies of the incredible work the gender platform does by two gender researchers, followed by an, a panel of experts who will also have a, a discussion. So first, let me introduce the gender platform, the CGIR gender platform to you. Next slide already. <laughs> so who are we? Um, I think that's the first thing that we need to discuss is we are a group of gender researchers who do research but want impact. Um, we look forward to working with everyone on this call as we do that. Um, we are a group of uh, gender researchers who are based in 15 centers, uh, CGIR centers across the world. 
So we span the world from um, Cali and Colombia all the way to the Philippines. We also span the world in uh, different areas of work we work on. So we have uh, gender work, uh, gender researchers working on livestock. We have gender researchers working on water management. We have the whole gamut. And what is really nice is that we have gender researchers who are actually embedded in the technical sciences. So you won't find a better uh, set of expertise on gender and uh, agricultural science in the world. What we also have is that we have a whole group of people who have different expertise within that, gen within that gender research, from policy to actual talking to breeders. Um, I have, we have one gender breeder, who, a gender scientist, who also works very closely with breeders. But when you hear her talk to breeders, you would think she's a breeder herself. So I think, again, we do have that expertise across, across the world. Um, we also have a whole group of partners that we work with within the CGIR, but also outside of the CGIR. So big data being one of those areas that we work on. Excellence in breeding is another area we work on, but we also work along with a lot of other uh, capacity development partners. And I'll talk about that a little bit further. What do we try to do in the CGR gender uh, platform, as you see and as you saw in our, in our light, nice little video, what we try to do is work with CG uh, to innovate and to integrate. So I think those are two very important points. And to what end? For our, our vision is a world in which gender equality drives transformation towards equitable, sustainable, productive and climate resilient food systems. So in other words, to put it very simple, putting gender equality at the heart of uh, agricultural research. And we wanna do that from within. Uh, we wanna do that uh, with people. And so I think those are very important parts. But we also have two very important streams of what we're doing um, in this uh, platform. One is imp uh, improving agriculture by reducing the inequities in there by giving women more voice, by making them part of the decision making. If there's one thing that COVID has taught me at least is that we do need women more at the beginning in the decision making. So how can we make agriculture that also represents women, that also allows women to be part of the solution and not only part of the problem as often as seen. I think that's very important in what we do. But we also need to make sure that agriculture actually expands the power of women that it actually empowers them, that it actually gives them what they need. And I really talk about gives them what, what they need because we often have a, a, a tendency to actually decide already for women what they want. So how do we get that to give them their voice in what they want? Now, besides partnerships, one of the ways we do it, which is very important, is through what we have, what we call three modules. And one of them is called evidence methods and alliances. Now, let me start in the next slide by explaining some of this, because I think this is also quite important to understand. So Michael, can I have the next slide? Okay, so first one is evidence. Now, if a lot of, if, if some of you have been in the session right before this one, which was also, which was uh, an amazing session done by a ward about policy and policy making, one of the big things was evidence. Everybody keeps talking about evidence. And why is that so important? Well, partly it's important because a lot of gender issues is cultural. It's about norms. It's about values. So it becomes emotive. And we need to move it to the next level where we have the evidence, the evidence base to make the right decisions. So I think that's very important. And that's where the CGIR gender platform is also very important. So one of the first ones is making the invisible visible. And um, we've been doing this for years with a lot of different partners, but actually showing the roles that men and women play in agriculture and the importance. And one of the case studies will just uh, illustrate that in an er area that most of us probably haven't thought about, uh, wood fuel. But one of the important things here as well is understanding some of that, um, what that actually means, how that making the invisible visible, what that actually means. So one of the ones, for instance, for us making the invisible was when we look at livestock, and I've worked a lot on livestock, what you see is that women do a lot of the work in livestock, but the returns and what the benefits are invisible for them. And so that's also important. How do we actually show that? How do we make that more visible so that policymakers can use it? 
The other area is having an impact. Where are some specific areas in the research that we can actually have an impact? And one of the ones I'm very proud of that the platform and the CGIR is working on is, for instance, the breeding uh, profiles getting gender into breeding or crop breeding and livestock breeding profiles. So that from the beginning, when we decide to breed something, we have gender in it. And if we work with the, with the uh, private industry on that, we could have such a big impact. So I think that's important, doing the research to figure out where are the points. And then, like I said, the other areas, data and knowledge gaps that we have. Time poverty is one of them. We don't understand a lot about it but also the quality of that information and the value of that information I think is important and are there areas that we haven't even thought of that we need more evidence on. But you're not going to get evidence without the right methods, right? Um, one of the big problems that we often have in gender is that often it's seen as a little study here, a little study there. And one of the big things that the gender platform does by bringing all these 15 centers together and all the different partners is to develop robust research. How do we actually develop robust research that can be used for policymakers? Something as simple as what is disaggregated, gender disaggregated data. It sounds so simple, but to actually implement it systematically and in a robust way is often complicated. It has um, implications for funding for your budget because you all of a sudden you need to ask more than one person in the household and asking the, the, the uh, women's head, head of household does not represent all the women in agriculture. It probably only represents something like 10%. So understanding that. But the other one else is important is getting comparable data. What is some comparable data that we can use across countries? And one of the big tools that the, that the, that the CGIR, especially through IFBRI has been developing is the Women's Empowerment Agricultural Index. That allows us to compare at times what's going on with empowerment across the world also very important. And are there other methodologies that we need to develop? Gender as a science in, in agriculture is relatively young. So we want to develop that. And that's where we do the cutting edge science, where we are looking at how can you do gender transformative approaches at scale? How does that work? How can you do that robustly? What methodologies do you need? All those things are incredibly important. The next one, as most important is our alliances. And that's why we're so happy to launch this uh, platform at the AGRF. We want to build stronger alliances and there's several reasons for them. I think the most important is to build a stronger and relevant agenda. We need to know from all our people, all the people who are engaged in gender and agriculture, what are some areas of research that you find important that we can help with that make what our agenda relevant to the, the women and the men we're trying to support. The other part of alliances is how do we build capacity? And again, if you were in the session before this, there was a lot of discussion on how do you build uh, the capacity in, 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 uh, in the policymaker arena and also of women in, in agriculture. We want to build the next generation of gender researchers in the CGR and in agriculture. But to do that, we need to develop a pathway, a gender uh, researcher pathway, career pathway, so that they actually understand that there is something to be gained out of a career in gender. But most important, we want to have a broader impact. And to do that, we can't do that alone, but we need to do that with partners. Now, as one of the last things I did want to say is that to have a broader impact, we need to talk to policymakers. And again, that means that we need to have the right evidence, the right methods, and, and make sure that we can get that out there uh, to everybody. So as one of the last things I just wanted to say is there are several ways you can join us. Every year we do have a conference where we present research and gender research where we would like to have the younger people join and we would like everybody to present their research on gender and agriculture. We also have a newsletter and we also have webinars and we're always looking for interested guests. So if anybody is interested, please uh, join us. I am going to hand over to Vivian, but I did want to quickly say, say a thanks to all the panel members and the speakers today, and also to the uh, uh, donors that have helped and who support our, our platform. Really appreciate it. I hand it over to Vivian now. Thank you, Nicolene, uh, for that uh, introduction on what the gender platform is about. Um, 
I'd encourage the audience to keep tweeting. One thing I heard from Nicolene is that for broader impact, we need to talk to policy and we need to have the right evidence. Yet to have the right evidence, we need to have the right methods. So that's a takeaway for me. You can keep sharing yours in the chat box and you can also tweet at us uh, using the uh, Twitter handle at CGI Agenda. So at this point, let's move in and let's uh, uh, launch the platform. And to do that, I have Stephen Potter, who is the Director of Agriculture and Food Systems and also a CGIAR Council member. He is with the, uh, with the Department of Global Affairs within the Government of Canada. Welcome, Stephen. Thank you very much. Good day, everyone. Thanks to uh, Nicolene and congratulations on her for leading the, uh, the gender platform. I bring you greetings uh, from Ottawa and from the Government of Canada to the participants all over the world. Um, I'm honored to speak on, on this occasion on a topic of great significance and in the presence of a very impressive panel of experts on gender equality and really looking forward to the discussion. We really uh, deeply congratulate CGIR on uh, this launch of uh, the gender platform designed to put gender equality at the forefront of global agricultural research for development. Gender research that closes evidence gaps, develops appropriate methods and measures and enhances capacities is, is a vital part of the fight for gender equality and empowerment in food systems and for justice, global justice. And we're really pleased to see gender being launched on the margins of the AGRF. Partnerships, as Nicolina said, partnerships and alliances with other agricultural and technical organizations and with policy makers and policy advisors will be essential to advance this mutual agenda on gender equality and empowerment in agriculture and food systems. We strongly encourage the platform to continue this uh, process of expanding and deepening relationships and communicating its work uh, during this uh, African-led event and, and, and beyond. And speaking for the Canadian government, we are absolutely confident that the gender platform will make an important contribution to building a more equitable, sustainable, productive, and climate resilient food system. Uh, Canada and our, our government use women as powerful agents of change within agriculture and food sectors who can actively contribute to improving food security, advancing economic development, and mitigating or adapting to the effects of climate change. Uh, it is only when women's knowledge and know-how are considered on an equal footing to men's knowledge that CGIR will achieve its goal of food security and sustainability. In line with this, uh, Canada is a strong supporter and we were an early supporter of, of the gender platform from its earliest days. Just this year, we have announced a contribution of $40 million to CGIR overall, including four and a half million for, for gender platform, uh, which as I mentioned, came, came very earlier on and, and was the precursor to what has now become gender with all caps. Our support, uh, our targeted support for the gender platform and kind of uh, ring fence support will help accelerate CGIR's efforts to more fully integrate gender it, into its research uh, programs. And there's lots of scope for that. Uh, and to build, uh, uh, to further enhance the transformative potential of women for agricultural production and natural resources management. Um, I'd just like to mention that you know, we're really happy also about the one CGIR process that, that's underway, and that's one of the uh, hashtags as well. It's really important to see the uh, 15 centers and, and alliances working, working as one and putting gender at the center of, of this new kind of more robust uh, research agenda. And as evidence, early evidence of that, uh, we congratulate CGIR on the appointment earlier this summer of its inaugural executive management team, um, which is which is gender balanced and uh, its new uh, common board, which is also gender balanced and diversified across several other dimensions. There's a great opportunity with the Food System Summit next year to uh, really profile uh, the gender platforms activities and to continue to accelerate gender and multilateral and other agriculture and food systems initiatives. So just to wrap up, we, you know, we're living in a time of uh, significant global challenges. Uh, that's an understatement. Um, and, but it's also 
a time for opportunities and for thinking differently. And gender plat the gender platform comes at a really opportune time. Uh, it's a it's like I said a much needed initiative that will reinvigorate. You're probably hearing my cat there reinvigorate the global food systems development agenda through timely, high quality and meaningful gender research and evidence generated by CGIR and its partners. And we really look forward to how the gender platform will help advance research in agriculture and food security to address systemic barriers and harmful social norms that prevent women and girls from realizing their full potential and as was highlighted in the early video and, and, and affects the, the community at large. And as we move ahead with today's panel, I, I think it's important to reflect on some important gender equality lessons in, in agriculture, some of which Nicolene has already highlighted. We must move beyond simply including women as contributors to an agricultural value chain and think of them more as leaders and developers of sustainable food systems. This means addressing social and legal barriers to women's empowerment at the local and national governance levels to ensure women can access adequate training programs to contribute to the agricultural industry and the food system. This means considering women agricultural specialists and their research as equal to men's research and putting it forward to advocate for policy change. This means using robust research and evidence to demonstrate how women's contributions to agricultural sustainability are key to adapting to climate change realities because women are on the front line of this fight. So congratulations uh, on the launch uh, of the gender platform today in Kigali and worldwide. And uh, we're really witnessing the establishment of a new and diverse partnership so we can, we can work together on, the, on this uh, important agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, for those remarks. And indeed, we do appreciate all the support that has come in uh, from the Canadian government. I think one thing that stood with me is that um, we should think of women as contributors towards sustainable food systems. And also uh, the platform being a very huge uh, contributor towards uh, the, the entire agenda of uh, food systems and therefore the need for partnerships and alliances. So thank you very much. I think at this point we can move to Nicoline maybe to get us going before we get into the crux of the matter. Okay, so unfortunately we're in COVID at the moment. So we were hoping to do this in actual physical uh, status, but I have here an official uh, launch uh, <laughs> ribbon that I am going to cut to officially launch <laughs> the platform. So here I go. There we are. <laughs> to officially launch and thanks everyone. And now we continue with uh, the gender research. Yes, indeed, Nicoline, thanks for that. And I agree now we can get into the the, the, the subject matter that we're here for. Okay, so uh, we want to get to showcase some of the gender research that goes on within the CG. And we have uh, two of uh, gender researchers from the CG. The first one is uh, Marcus Ihalainen, who works for the Center for International Forestry Research, CIFO. He is a senior research officer and gender and social inclusion co coordinator. Welcome, Marcus, to present the first case study. He's going to talk about how to advance gender equality through interventions in urban food supply system. Thank you. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the uh, earlier presenters too. So I'm going to talk a bit about our work on uh, gender and wood fuel. And so just to set the context a bit, 90% uh, of households in sub-Saharan Africa rely on wood, wood fuel for cooking. Uh, so urbanization uh, is increasing the demand, especially for charcoal. So this has obviously raised also some concerns around the environmental sustainability, particularly as you know, much of the production and trade happens outside of legal frameworks. But then at the same time, charcoal value chains offer a really, really critical income source for millions of people around the continent. So the work I will talk about uh, takes place within a larger a uh, study funded by EC DEFCO, uh, which is aimed at providing options for more inclusive and sustainable wood fuel governance in sub-Saharan Africa. So in terms of gender, conventional wisdom kind of dictates that charcoal business is a male activity. 
And so discussions around gender aren't really relevant. And, but we wanted to kind of examine this assumption. And so we conducted a review where we just compiled all of the bits and pieces of information that's out there on women's participation and on gender dynamics uh, in charcoal value chains. And what we found was that women are indeed actually participating across the entire value chain from production through to trade. But what we also found was that for a lot of women, charcoal was sort of a last resort option. So their participation, especially, especially in production, was often motivated by a loss of agricultural income due to climatic events or loss of male labor in the household. And the other thing is that when women participated, they often don't do so on equal footing to men. So women producers tend to have less access to resources, use smaller kilns, face barriers to participating in producer associations, or have less access to family labor than their male co counterparts. Uh, female transporters are often excluded from the more lucrative, often motorized long distance transport, and female traders often face you know, disproportionate financial and mobility related constraints. So in, in addition, women tended to be much more dependent on charcoal income and female heads of households in particular who are overrepresented in this sector. So when you take this information, you wonder how can these results then inform uh, efforts to provide options for more sustainable wood fuel value chains? Well, one thing is what we've seen is that often sort of well-intended efforts to curb environmental degradation can often work to marginalize those who are already marginalized if you don't take into consideration differentiated abilities uh, to participate in decision-making or to comply with regulations. So in addition to kind of raising awareness at the national level, we're supporting community resource user groups uh, in developing more equitable governance arrangements. But the second thing is that sort of closing gender gaps in terms of resource access and capacities, et cetera, it's not just critical from a strictly an equity perspective, but it's also to ensure that both women and men can contribute towards more sustainable and productive food systems. So in Zambia, for in instance, we're investing in development forest restoration options that respond to the needs of both women and men. Uh, and in collaboration with female fish smokers in Cameroon, we're developing more effective smokers to reduce wood fuel demand while also improving their production. So just to make a few broader points in closing. First, I think that with this shows the gender dynamics in food systems aren't static. So as kind of economic and political and environmental changes such as climate change, you know, are altering the very premises for food systems, new opportunities and challenges for women's empowerment and gender equality kind of present themselves. So for our work, you know, to help safeguard women's rights and support you know, the tr gender transformative vision that the platform has, has articulated, we really need to, you know, we need work that's aimed at understanding the processes that drive social change on the ground. Second, enabling both women and men to contribute as well as to benefit from more effective and more sustainable food production is gonna be absolutely critical uh, in, in, you know, our efforts to pursue a more safe and just space for humanity. So what this does is it, re it requires engagement and efforts at multiple levels. So developing and scaling out gender responsive technologies and practices is, is vital, but they also need to be supported by gender responsive policies and governance arrangements at, at different levels. And then finally, our strategic re gender research uh, really needs to sort of meaningfully inform CGIR research more broadly. And so this goes beyond sort of you know, project level gender mainstreaming and, and really necessitates an institutional recognition of gender equality as a core objective. And, and this is really where I see the kind of immense potential of this gender platform. So bringing together gender experts in food systems under one roof, allowing us to identify and address critical knowledge gaps and leverage each other's uh, comparative advantages while uh, constituting a really authoritative body that can you know, draw on decades of gender research to influence more equitable food systems. So thank you so much. Thank you, Marcus. Well appreciated. Excellent presentation. And I just want to appreciate our guests. I understand we have uh, participants all the way from um, Australia where it's past midnight. We have guests joining in from the US this morning. Uh, from the West, East Africa, Asia, you're all welcome, even as we launch the gender platform. So um, let's move on to the next uh, presentation. And um, 
we have Aileen. Uh, Aileen is going to uh, present a second case study uh, that will sort of showcase what goes on uh, in terms of gender research in the CG. And she's going to talk about um, how to advance gender equality through entrepreneurship and women's inclusion in the markets with a focus on beans. So Aileen uh, is a gender specialist at the Alliance of Bioversity International and um, International Center for Tropical Agriculture. And uh, she's going to talk about this next case. Welcome Aileen. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Vivian. So I'm going to be presenting two exciting case studies uh, to show how gender equality can be advanced through entrepreneurship and uh, women inclusion in the market, looking at being. So uh, I'm actually going to start by presenting a general principle that can actually help us mainstream gender and entrepreneurship for replications across commodities and countries. Uh, in the beans value chain, the fact that the north where you have a lot of women taking part is basically production and post harvest. And this actually is a lucrative area that we can promote entrepreneurship. However, you still have few women in this uh, side of the value chain as a result of either limited land access, labor capital, as well as skills. So the first case study, we have a lady in um, Burundi known as Christella. Uh, Christella came up with this idea of producing nutritious bean-based flour to win infants and lactating mothers. That's because at the point where she was a lactating mother, she couldn't have uh, affordable bean-based products for her to use. So she started uh, using just, you know, the rudimentary uh, pans on the three stones to be able to roast the different uh, maize, beans, and other products that she wanted to use to make the uh, uh, flour. And also at this point, she had really limited access to any capital and had no idea how she could take this product to the market. So uh, the first thing we did with Christella, one of the interventions was understanding her business case and also seeing if investing in this activity with Christella would be able to have impact on nutrition, especially in Burundi where we have high levels of malnutrition. Uh, the second thing we did was um, also working with even the local artisans to see if we could have a locally made roaster that would help her roast the products instead of using the three stones uh, uniformly. And after that, uh, we also did, um, brought her to Kenya to have a discussion with one of the bean based products uh, uh, that we were working with, Azuri, uh, where she got information on how to develop her product, how to do branding, how to market it. And then also she met with another partner, Rainbow, uh, to get a solar bubble dryer, where she would be able to dry her products even in the rainy season. Now, uh, being able to put all these interventions together with Christella, uh, she has been able to move from, you know, frying her, her products on the three stone to actually having a fully functional automated facility. She's moved to a bigger facility in the industrial area in uh, Bujumbura, Burundi. Uh, she was able to get a loan from the bank uh, to get some of the extra facilities she needed, for example, like, um, um, a solar panel where she could actually be able to continue her production even when there was no electricity. Uh, as a result of this, the demand even for the products increased, and so they had to move from working with just 200 farmers to 5,000 farmers, of which about 60% of women. Uh, she's been able to get over 100,000 US dollars annually and also has moved her products from just uh, Burundi to Rwanda and as well as the DRC. And uh, interestingly, Christella also now even has the confidence where she's able to pitch her ideas, like the last HRF in Ghana and Rwanda, she was there to present her product and also to teach all the different ways that she can be able to get additional uh, income definitely to boost up her business. The second case study I'm going to focus on is uh, in Tanzania. This is a young guy known as Afred. And um, Afred had a treasure which could uh, trash only one crop, like a prototype. But as a result of our collaboration with the um, Soybean Innovation Lab at the Missouri State University, we were able to train local artisans in uh, Tanzania, Burundi, uh, including Afred. And with this training and skill that Afred got, Afred has been able to upgrade his prototype from just trashing one uh, crop 
to actually uh, multi-crop treasure. So the treasure he has presently can treasure up to eight stable food grains, including beans. He's been able to sell 128 uh, of these uh, multi-crop treasures uh, in Tanzania, but also in Burundi as well. Um, uh, one important thing we realized with the treasure is uh, women are now able to do more productive activities and even spend a lot more time at home compared to before when they used to do a lot of the manual threshing themselves. So with the treasure, you can spend less than five minutes threshing uh, nine kg of beans. Um, the take home message is basically that um, if we want to push entrepreneurship and I, I, for my title where we say train a woman and feed the nation, we really need to be deliberate. So we need to be deliberate on identifying women, identifying youth, uh, that we want to work with. Um, we need to provide the technical and financial support, but this should be informed definitely by business analysis uh, as a result so that uh, we can have a lot more sustainability. Um, there is a need for uh, an initial support um, to break out of the trap because in most cases, women usually don't have the money starting the businesses, might have just um, some few... Um, some few um, money, some few, sorry, excuse me. They can actually just have some few um, products that they have, but also then they need this technical support. Uh, the last thing I want to say is uh, being able to push uh, entrepreneurship, it doesn't have to be a one-off support, but basically it's one where we need to work uh, with these um, Men, men, whether they're men uh, uh, entrepreneurs, the female entrepreneurs or the youth entrepreneurs, we need to really do the work together with them, but not just provide a one-off support. Thank you. Thank you, Aileen. Indeed, uh, let's be deliberate. Train a woman, feed the nation. Okay, so thank you again to our audience. Keep uh, engaging with us via your comment box, via your chat box. We will come to your questions in a bit. But for now, let's get into our panel. We have an interesting and um, excellent, exciting panel lined up for you to be able to sort of steer this conversation forward. And uh, so I will, at this point, introduce them. We have three panelists uh, this evening or this morning from wherever you're joining us. So we have... Um, Schengen Fan, who is uh, part of the CGIAR board. Uh, Schengen, if you can um, just say hello before I introduce oh. the next. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we see you. Okay. okay, our next um, panelist is uh, Maria Maiga, who is Gender and Social Development Advisor of CORAF. CORAF is the West and Central African Council for Agricultural Research and Development. Hello, everyone. My name is Mariam Maiga from CORAF. Okay, Mariam. And we have uh, Kagwiria Kome, who's manager of Food Initiative for the Rockefeller Foundation. Hello, it's an honor to be here. My name is Kagwiria Kome. Looking forward to the panel. Okay, great. So let's delve into the questions. And uh, I will start with you, uh, Schengen. I actually forgot to uh, mention that you are also a chair, you are a professor at the College of Economics and Management of China Agricultural University in Beijing. So apologies for that, but let's uh, delve into the questions. So uh, starting with uh, Schengen, one of the core features of this platform is to incentivize uh, cross-center collaboration and to leverage our complementary strengths in order to address some of the most pressing evidence gaps that we have on gender and agriculture. So in your opinion, where do you think we should start? So could you help us draw out the most pressing issues? Thank you, Olivia. Yes, thank you uh, for launching this platform. Congratulations. My name is Shukran Sen, Sen. So I have been a fan of CGIS China Research. I was in practice for 10 years and was a researcher at CGI for so many years. A huge congratulations from my heart. Now, let me first mention that women are facing great challenges. 
as and many others said, women do not have equal access to assets, to land, to agricultural services, financial services, financial services, and equally important, they do not have access to political power. So if we look at politicians, government officials, we see very few women there. So the challenges are great. As you already mentioned, by addressing the gender gap, there will be huge impact on poverty reduction, on hunger reduction. We know that more than 100 million of hungry people will be removed if simply we narrow the gap of accessing natural resources between men and women. Okay, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll just cut you short because um, the connection is a bit difficult to hear. Perhaps you could maybe just check. Okay. It I will, All right, I okay. okay. Is it better now? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the connection is not good, I know. <laughs> okay, now, so now what should we do? I think one is, well, you mentioned the evidence. I fully agree. We need evidence to convince our politicians, our stakeholders to take action. But before that, we needed data. I think CGIA must connect the gender disaggregated data. Anything we do, any data we connect at CGIA must dis disaggregate between men and women. I think this is the first. Without data, we will not be able to generate solid evidence. Now, the mainstreaming and the integrating gender into all our work, whether it's a policy work, nutrition work, science and technology, is a must. It is a must. And we know that if we do not take gender into consideration, the technology sometimes can do more harm. I grew up in a small village in China. I observed how my mother, you know, as a smallholder farmer, suffered during the so-called the Chinese Green Revolution. You know, when the when the newer variety introduced to my village, the short, you know, short duration, and the uh, high yielding. So instead of two crops, we were able to produce three crops. But three crops needed more water, more land, and more labor, more time. Whose time? Women's time. So even before Green Revolution, my mother already worked probably 10 hours a day. But the, when the Green Revolution technology came to my village, high yielding varieties, e reactor was part of it. She had to work 13 hours, 14 hours a day during the peak production season. So you can see sometimes the technologies actually disbenefit or disempower the women. We must make sure that. We don't do that at CGIR. Mm -hmm. Now, from CGIR, from CGIR side, I think mainstreaming, integrating gender into our work is very critical. So I think the work of gender work, the gender work should not be just done by few great women. Men should do it. I think Marco did a great example. Men should do the gender work too. It's, it's not just a small, you know, a group of women who are sitting in a corner doing, connecting their data, writing their articles. No, I think everybody from the top CGIR, the CGIR uh, to everybody uh, in the system. Now, the, as Steve said that now we have one CGIR with one strategy. I think that strategy, unified strategy must integrate the main, mainstream gender into that strategy. And we still have a couple of months to work with. So we are looking forward to a strong gender component, integration, mainstreaming into that, uh, that's in, into that option. So I'm very confident with one CGIR, I think gender will be more prominent. We we'll make sure that women will be, let's say, rich, empowered, and finally they will benefit from all CGIR's research. Thank you. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to come back to you uh, shortly, but maybe we could hear from uh, uh, Kaguria, Kaguria Kome. Um, what are the most pressing things that we should address? Maybe you could just add on to what um, uh, Schengen said. All right. Thank you, Vivian. Let me answer your question by sharing more about the work of the Rockefeller Foundation in urban markets and some of the evidence gaps in gender we have identified. So the food initiative goal is to increase the diet quality for vulnerable populations. And to achieve this, we're promoting the consumption of nutrition foods. 
urban markets play a central role in distribution of that food. Therefore, we are in helping in design and uh, helping to design and demonstrate smart markets of the future in East Africa. And the smart market will be designed to prioritize public health protocols, but also ensure that there is restorative and regenerative by design, equipping markets with solar technology, water harvesting infrastructure, and waste management systems, but also importantly strengthening supply networks to meet food demands for all. So as we work to bring uh, this concept to life, we want to ensure that we design with a central focus on all users to enable them achieve their full potential. And of importance is that women traders constitute about 80% of the workforce in the marketplace. So the research questions that are important for us as we look forward to a partnership is around three areas. We want to understand and commit to gender sensitive urban market infrastructure. Most recently, I visited a new state-of-the-art market in one of the food basket areas in Kenya. I noticed all the women were displaying their goods on the floor. On further interrogation, they shared that the display benches were, were too high and they got severe backaches if they used them. So as we progress in this area, we want to ensure their user experience is captured to ensure that infrastructure designs create a, work, a safe work environment for all to thrive. The second area we want to engage on women uh, on research is women's participation in the urban market economy. So in Kenya, in the formal sector, women constitute about 47% of the labor force, but only own about 9% of the businesses. But this dynamics shifts when we get to the urban markets where 80% of the retailers are women. But you look at where the value is captured in the value chain, it's mainly in the wholesale segment where male traders dominate. So as we redesign the urban markets, we need to have an understanding of the power dynamics so that we can break those barriers for women to participate at all levels. Finally, for the Rockefeller Foundation, we want women to prosper in the marketplace. For those that live in Kenya, um, the largest market in, in Rift Valley was featured on TV, as uh, I think in about March, as the women traded had traders had self-organized to begin a gym class every day at 1 p.m. when operations at the wholesale market were minimal to address the increasing cases of obesity and other non-communicable diseases. For me, this showcased how we need to understand their needs and aspirations for services in the market. These are the services that create new employment opportunities. So for example, uh, the, uh, what we had about technologies that for processing or cold storage, but also those services that enable them to, to thrive such as healthcare security or childcare. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Kagwiria. And um, I want to bring in Mariam, but I think I should take the next question so that she could perhaps uh, respond uh, uh, to the two. And Mariam, um, the CGI Agenda Platform also brings together some of the world's leading experts on gender and agriculture. And we have different research projects that span across the globe. So um, I'm aware that CORAF recently launched a new gender strategy. So in your own personal opinion, what are the opportunities that you see to leverage our collective expertise so that we can be able to impact more lives? And I think as you answer that question, you can actually also add in some comments to answer the first question, which was about the pressing issues, the gaps that exist. Mariam, please, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. So uh, let me present a rapidly core uh, gender strategy and come up to your question. So CORAP is the West Africa Central African Council for Agricultural Education Development, and the organization covers 23 countries. So the mandate of the organization is to facilitate development, dissemination and, uh, of uh, technologies to enhance productivity for sustainable food and nutrition security in West and Central Africa. So then the management of CORAP came to know that uh, unless we provide the researchers from the NAS known as the key constituent of the organization with the needed support to develop gender sensitive technologies will not be able to meet the development of the organization. I mean, I mean here to contribute to stable food and nutrition security. So we mean by gender sensitive technology, technology that can really, that, that can really serve as labor saving technology, technology that are not going to increase on women's burden, their workload, 
that also technology that can be useful for income generation, for job creation, and wealth creation. This is what we mean by gender sensitive technology. And we do have a database called META, Marché des Innovations et des Technologies Agricoles. And within the META, we have a database, specific database on those the, on these uh, so-called gender sensitive technologies. So then the strategy that we use was very useful for us to move on when it's come to answer to address gender dimension in agriculture research and development. Core of uh, gender policies uh, objective is to facilitate equitable access to agricultural research development, resources, opportunities, and benefit for men and women, especially for the most vulnerable group. Then the gender strategy is shaped by, by key activities, like for any core project, we should have minimum 40% women beneficiaries. Number one. Number two, the screening of technologies help very much because it helps us to analyze the gender gap in the project, in the core of uh, that project, and also to identify the corrective action and the indicators to track the gender progress and also for impact assessment. Capacity building is also key here because we, it's, it's, it's good to tell to people mainstream gender dimension, but if they don't have uh, some knowledge and the skills on how to proceed, then it's a problem. So, so we, we always organize for our stakeholders gender training, and we focus on the institutionalization of gender tools and protocols. It has been very useful for us, honestly. So another key element in, of the strategy is to assist the countries with gender action plan at the national level, and also with recruitment of gender specialists at the national level. It helped very much. So also for the monitoring uh, purpose, we organize twice a year organize uh, BC and also field visit to assess the state of implementation of the gender action plan. And lastly, we provide gender support to regional organization at demand. In fact, the backbone of core of gender strategy is to facilitate development, transfer and access and adoption of gender and climate smart technology and innovation along the value chain in production, processing and marketing to foster women and youth empowerment. So I mentioned the meta that we have, the gender sensitive technology. The strategy was very useful and helped us to go above the 40% women target in the project. Then to come, uh, to, come to your question, the, 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 the research gap. For us, it's believed that social cultural dimension can impact on technologies, dissemination, access, and adoption. And I feel like this is missing a bit in gender research. So in, we, we may need to address the issues in gender research agenda to facilitate the dissemination and the adoption of technology for greatest impact. I think so. So, so far, good for me. Maybe if you have another question. So for, for yeah. us, in terms of, because for us, we really not need to, we, we need to develop objectives to reach system of food and nutrition security with the scaling of proven technology. Because we really not need to reinvent the wheel, the proven technology exists. At Coraf, we have a database, the proven technology exists. That can really help for agricultural transformation in Africa, but also for women and youth empowerment. So the challenge you are faced with is about the scaling of these technologies. And then to, to, to address the issues, we, 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 we came to know that we need private sector to come in for the production of the technology. But uh, about the research, uh, uh, research agenda uh, uh, issues, we believe that we may need to address social cultural dimension in technology access, adoption, and the, uh, yes, for business impact, yes. Thank I you, thank so. you, Mariam. Thank you, Mariam. For, thank you very much for drawing out those issues. Um, I can assure you that we will definitely look at them. Uh, maybe I should bring in uh, Schengen to sort of uh, weigh in, still on the same. Uh, where do you see uh, the greatest opportunity to leverage our collective expertise? How can we ensure that we impact more lives? What is CGI I have? 
Uh, I think your connection is still not okay. Mm, um, okay, I will try my best. Now it's okay. 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 Is it better now? Yeah. I think CGI had enough expertise from China already. But I, one thing we have not done well is to work with the NARD to train the gender experts in the national systems in Africa, in Asia, and so on. This is I think one area we must work on. We must leverage the whole national literacy system to do more research on gender. Okay. okay. I I will I will have to come back to you maybe when the connection is much better. Uh, okay. About that, yes, Kaguria, do you want to weigh in on the stem? Sure. Um, to the question about how we can move from research to change in women's lives, let me just share. Uh, an, an example to showcase some of our successes in moving research from the lab to the land. RF in partnership with ICPE, IGRC, and Australia Aid funded research on the area of insectful feeds to understand the science, the nutrition benefit, and also the safety of the product. But most important area for us was ensuring that once the science was understood, was working with actors that would benefit from the innovation and scale it. So in this case, the actors were existing feed manufacturers, existing businesses that were generating waste that could be redirected as feed for the insects, farmers groups that were purchasers of the animal feed, and also just businesses that saw the potential and were testing it at a small scale. So we worked with the existing businesses by providing handholding research support to help them navigate the science, but also implement the businesses in their farms as they grow in confidence to develop the product. So what began as a research partnership uh, within two years, one of the businesses in Sectipro is a successful business that is currently the largest insect-based feed producer in East Africa. The business is women-owned and led by Talash that's 25 years young and creating employment opportunities for 50 people. So as for us and from our experience, being intentional from the design phase to ensure it is actionable, but also creating opportunities for all, particularly women and youth to thrive is what has worked. Okay, thanks. Um, are you now able to talk to us, uh, Schengen? Okay, I move to one question. Is it better now? No, it's not better. Okay, let's hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so uh, what I said is um, we must work together with the NARS, National Agricultural Research Center, to do the work CGI has done. Okay. Okay, so I think I unfortunately still have to cut you short because of the connection, but you can perhaps, if you're able, yeah. you could type in something in the chat box. Yeah. And okay, I would, I would do that. Okay, great. I will be able to read it. Okay, so um, to our audience, we just have yeah. about, um, we are supposed to wrap up in two minutes, but I, beg your pardon so that we can just wrap up in the next 10 minutes, if you allow us. So let's take one more question. And Mariam is going to uh, take us through the question. So Mariam, we have heard that uh, alliances, outreach, engagement form a key tenet for the platform strategy. So in your opinion, where do you see the priority areas and the entry points? so that we can be able to support gender transformative policy making. So we are looking at how can our research basically be able to support policy? How can we influence policy? Thank you so much. Actually, I think uh, partnerships is a basic thing, you know what, to push forward the gender agenda. I feel that sometimes it's like we, are, we have a sort of duplication of activities even for the gender research. So if we have a, a kind of platform where we know what you are doing as CORA, what you are doing as ICLISA, it's helped very much for, to pull synergy. So I think pulling synergy is very key here. Partnership is very key here. At least everyone knows who is doing what and what is needed, what is missing. So the gender research definitely is, is very important. Like what I was saying. When we are faced with challenges like 
if I take the case of Korak, how when we know that social cultural dimension can impact somehow on the access, the adoption of the technologies for greatest impact, then definitely we need gender research to address the issue. So if you take the case of Korak, we have the, what we call the gender dialogue. The gender dialogue is a, when, for instance, uh, the ED is going to meet with the World Bank, the European Union, and the USAID's partners. We are saying that, please make sure you have gender component in the agenda. It is also part of the protocols of the institutionalization of gender. So the institutionalization of gender has some protocols to meet. And for us, the gender dialogue is key. So I think using the gender dialogue can help also to make sure that the gender research can influence police and decision-making uh, uh, stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. Um, maybe I should move back to Stephen, uh, if you're still online. Um, uh, as a funder and uh, given the investments you have uh, made towards this work, uh, how can we move towards more gender transformative policy making within the platform? Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a super interesting uh, discussion uh, as, as expected. Um, I do think, um, you know, Nico, going back to Nicolene's uh, initial initial presentation with the with the three the three circles and her emphasis on on generating um, um, gender uh, evidence uh, to, to to support decision making, uh, that that's really key, and, and I think the movement uh, uh, within the CGIR system to join up and and as Schengen and others have mentioned to make gender, not just the work of the gender platform, but the work of everyone uh, within the system as an integrated kind of component of, it, of everything uh, that's done for CGIR research and in its alliances and elsewhere. Um, I think you're really going to um, start to see um, a much greater production of, of evidence and um, cases, case studies, et cetera, that will be convincing to policymakers and that will help to uh, really make an impact uh, on the ground. So I think everything's headed in the right direction, but really to make it work, it's going to require um, really a lot of collaboration uh, with, with, um, with, with researchers with uh, alliances with the National Agricultural and Research uh, Agricultural Research Systems, as Marcus has highlighted, as as well, you just need to 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 get the um, uh, get the action uh, happening. I think from a funder perspective, um, I've neglected to mention in my initial comments that that really in, in the funders of CGIR on the System Council are a hundred percent behind. Uh, this agenda and and see it as uh, as crucial, uh, and I think that the funding will flow to this research uh, as well as, as the um, gender platform and other elements of the system uh, start to put together concrete research proposals. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. And uh, Schengen has managed to. Uh, send me his thoughts and he says CG needs to build NAS capacity to do more gender research and donors should follow Canada's example uh, just as Stephen just spoke about that to increase CG's funding on the one hand and be a mark 10% to gender research on the other. So thanks for those uh, contributions and uh, thanks to all my panelists. At this point I would like to bring this discussion to a close but not before engaging our audience. And um, I want to ask our audience on the other side, uh, perhaps you could type in the chat box, what is the one thing that you will do to help advance gender equality so as to transform African food systems? So what is your takeaway message from this session that we have just had? Or what is your pledge? So please, uh, you could be typing that in the chat box. And at this point, I want to hand this uh, back to Nicolene uh, for the next session, which is uh, 
to conclude and also to just say thank you. Thanks everyone. I look forward to seeing what everyone is going to do to on Monday morning, as I say, to uh, contribute to gender equality in our food systems. Um, thank you everyone, all the panel members. Um, I, I noted a few things, which of course we will take on board. More engagement with NARS. I like the lab to land. Uh, we shouldn't have lonely gender researchers. We should have gender researchers that are uh, male as well, uh, which I, I, I really appreciate. We should build synergies, partnerships, and collaborations, which was one of the main reasons we wanted to do this at the AGRF, because we do believe that this is a, a very good community and we would like to work together. And as Miriam said, let's not duplicate things. Let's, let's build silly synergies. Let's leverage. Let's work with each other to make a, a wonderful partner, partnership and change the lives of, of men and women across uh, Africa. So again, I appreciate everyone's time, everyone's dedication. Uh, take a look at our video again. It is a nice little video um, and appreciate everyone's um, inputs and uh, the donors as well. And I'm happy to hear that St Stephen is saying that it will flow. Uh, and I look forward to working with everyone with that flow. <laughs> and uh, thanks and good evening and good morning, wherever you are. Appreciate everyone joining in and all the panel and all the speakers. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank bye -bye. you to all. Thanks, Bye-bye. Thanks.